Um, you may um, begin. Okay. So, hi everyone, I'm Denise. Today I will be presenting my capstone on Norma Mailer's The Armies of the Night, Expanding New Journalism. So I'll first go into my research process. Um, so I first had to choose a topic that I knew I would enjoy researching about. Um, I really enjoyed Norma Mailer's novel the, um, because the main subject was on the Vietnam War protests, but also because he incorporated his own subjectivity and himself as a character in the novel. These being literary tools that I've never seen a new journalistic author do. So I knew then that that was the kind of topic that I wanted to look into as an editor for the school's newspaper myself. I was also curious to analyze Mailer's use of subjectivity in his account because I always practiced being objective to follow AP guidelines for newspaper articles. Next, I had to find sources. So when looking at sources, I had to look for secondary sources that supported my thesis about Mailer's use of subjectivity in his novel and his argument of media distortion. Um, some secondary sources that helped me the most in my argument included Mosser's article called Norman Mailer's The Armies of the Night, Journalists as Novels and Intellectual, and Miller's article called No Success Like Failure, Existential Politics, and Norman Mailer's The Armies of the Night. Along with these secondary sources, I found two New York Times articles on the March on the Pentagon from 1967 to compare to Mailer's perspective of the event. So lastly, I had to write a thesis for my argument that expanded on arguments that were already made. I relied on my impression of the novel when I read the book, and that was, I've never read a new journalistic novel where the author incorporated himself as a character as well as created allegories and metaphors to provide a deeper meaning for the readers. I knew then that Norman Mailer has set the bar high for other new generalistic writers after him. So here's the thesis of my paper. Norman Mailer is a new journalistic writer who expands new journalistic techniques in his, in his novel, The Armies of the Night. He goes beyond the literary standard for the new journalistic genre that writers before him followed. He writes in a more subjective style that is more open to criticism in order for his readers to develop a deeper meaning of the events and make up their own opinion on the March on the Pentagon. He incorporates his subjective point of view by voicing his opinions and giving readers extended allegories and metaphors to dwell on the event and its experience to Mailer and the protesters. Mailer also provides the readers with an extensive character development of himself for readers to sympathize with him throughout the novel and to feel the emotions and experiences that he felt. I'll now go into my argument. I first compare my objective accounts like history and journalism to Norman Mailer's use of subjectivity in his novel. The objective accounts only write about the facts of the event without any bias, whereas Mailer uses the facts and his own experiences in his story for subjectivity. Objective accounts do not use any opinions from the author in the story, but Mailer uses opinions for interpretation in the novel. He can provide more interpretation of the March on the Pentagon when objective accounts can only recall the facts of the event. The objective accounts also depict that events follow a precise plan and conclude with total triumph, where the protesters, would, the protesters would get everything that they fought for. Whereas Mailer argues that is not the case realistically. Mailer recalls the March on the Pentagon not being well thought out and planned, and there is not a total triumph in the end, because total triumph is impossible to achieve. Lastly, objective accounts tend to manipulate reported speech and quote people out of context, and Mail references this distortion several times throughout the novel and makes sure to always provide words with context. So in my paper, I incorporated two New York Times articles on the events that Mailer accounts for in the novel to compare the two perspectives. In the first New York Times article, it recalled that Norman Mailer was arrested along with six others, whereas Norman Mailer describes his arrest as a lone event. He does this to focus on himself in that moment and to express and show his feelings to the reader. 
The New York Times article also does not have any details on how Norman Mailer felt about his arrest or any emotions in that matter. Whereas Norman Mailer goes into detail of his thoughts and emotions before and after the arrest, providing the reader a deeper understanding of the event that a reporter ever could from the sidelines. The other account that the New York Times and Norman Mailer recalled was his day in court after his arrest. The article was only a short paragraph, whereas Mailer goes into nine pages of detail. What the New York Times doesn't include was Mailer's lawyer trying to argue his way out of the charge until finally settling to appeal the conviction. The New York Times only recalled the appeal and wrote about it in a confusing and negative way, where the reader could read it as Mailer being coerced into the protest. Mailer did not mention that in his novel and meant for his arrest to be symbolically significant for the protests. Looking at the comparison of the New York Times and Mailer's account provides a deeper understanding of how the media can distort events. One way Mailer expanded new journalism was through his many incorporations of styles and genres. And one of those genres is how the novel can be read as a kind of mock epic. The events in the novel focus on the March on the Pentagon that provides an essential scope, framework, and significance that are literary tools seen in epics. Mailer mocks the epic structure, though, by incorporating himself as the epic hero of the story. He writes himself as a character that can be judged for value and behavior for his genius mentality. He plays the fool at first in the beginning when he drunkenly speaks at the Washington Ambassador Theater and when he stares down a Nazi when he's arrested. He also imitates an epic hero by showing he is fully committed to a cause he only half believes and is willing to go above and beyond for the cause by getting arrested. Another style that contributes to the epic is how the novel starts in Medius Rays, with the Times account of Mailer's speech at the theater before he follows up with his own account. Because Mailer writes his story in the framework of an epic, he makes the story more exciting for readers and encourages them to dive deeper into the issue of why soldiers were in Vietnam. So another way Mailer expanded new journalism was through the, his use of allegories and metaphors. The first allegory he incorporates in the novel is his comparison of history to a crazy house, which I will quote on the next slide. So, if the event took place in one of the crazy mansions, or indeed the crazy house of history, it is fitting that any ambiguous comic hero of such history should be not only off very much to the side of history, but that he should be an egotist of the most startling misproportions. Yet in command of a detachment classic in severity, such egotism being two-headed, thrusting itself therefore at home in a house of mirrors. Once history inhabits a crazy house, egotism may be the last tool left to history. Mailer invents the crazy house as a metaphor that defies the conventional methods for understanding and experience and where distortion is amplified by the mass media accounts of the March on the Pentagon. Mailer is arguing that he can report truthfully on the event because his opinion is more open and not attached to expectations. Instead of simply stating how history is a crazy house, he goes into deeper meaning as to why he thinks it is a crazy house and why it is significant for the reader to understand that history is a crazy house because of its distortion of events. Mailer also creates an allegory about a tower that represents subjectivity that I have on this slide. The tower is crooked and the telescopes warped, but the instruments of all sciences, history so much as physics, are always constructed in small or large error. What supports the use of them now is their intimacy with the master builder of the tower and lens grinder of the telescopes, yes, even the machinists of the barrels, has given some advantage for correcting the error of the instruments and the imbalance of his tower. So, the tower and telescope first represent Mailer's own text that lets readers understand the protest. Mailer's insistence that one must build the tower signifies that the novel is manipulated and formed by the writer's own personality, and that his journalism is imperfect since he incorporates his own subjective perspective. The tower, telescope, and microscope then represent more than just his text, but also himself as a reporter. By making obvious that the tower is also imperfect, he is acknowledging the imperfection of his own subjectivity before others can criticize him. The last metaphor Mailer incorporates is his experience with the exorcism of the Pentagon. 
Mailer saw the exorcism to be symbolically significant for the march where he and other protesters would raise the Pentagon 30 feet in the air, turn it orange, exercise its demons, and thereby end the Vietnam War. He and others chanted up demon in a symbolic act to protest against the Vietnam War and bring attention to others in hopes to change hearts and minds. The last literary tool that Mailer uses to expand new journalism is through his use of character development. Mailer's character development from beginning to the end of the armies of the night uh, to support the use of fiction perspective is another expansive tool he has used that has not been used in depth by others as much as he has incorporated it in the novel. Book one in his novel portrays Mailer's character growth from the participation in the march and the arrest for crossing a police line, whereas book two represents the small and brave group of protesters who face brutality in the Battle of the Wedge. Mailer contrasts himself to others in the novel to show the risks he is willing to take to find the truth. He uses the speech at the Ambassador's Hotel to turn his character away from a romantic isolationist to a more open-ended existentialist, where he first called himself the Romantic and Beast and ends with calling himself the Existentialist. When he realizes being a romantic isolationist is pointless, the character evolves from being a vain person to connecting to the audience. Mailer is the central character in book one and emphasizes that in his arrest. Not many other new journalistic authors can say that they were arrested for an important cause in order to give it more publicity. In book two, Mailer turns to work collectively with the other protesters instead of focusing just on himself. He uses the narrating I to speak for the we as a way to keep the collective from the harshness of the state and the march's leaders. This method follows the traditional collective where Mailer's character is combined with the collective one. Mailer shows that his character has evolved from the beginning of the book to the end by showing how he initially thought of himself and his intentions of the march to how could himself and the protesters collectively work to help stop the Vietnam War. Now I'll go into the significance of my research. Mailer has expanded the literary tools used for new journalism in many ways. He incorporates his own subjectivity along with historical and journalistic accounts to go more in depth and provide the reader a deeper meaning of the events. He writes allegories and metaphors to further connect to the reader on the march on the Pentagon, and he inserts himself as one of the central characters where the character evolves from the beginning of the novel to the end. No other author before him has immersed himself so deeply into a novel to the point that he is a central character that provides insight on the event. Norman Mailer uses these expansive literary tools in new journalism to set a standard for other new journalistic writers to go far and beyond just telling the facts of the story. And these are my works cited, my image citations, and are there any questions? Thank you very much, Denise. Everyone, if you have questions, please direct those to the chat. Um, romantic existential is um, mostly him just focusing on himself in the novel, which you see in book one. Um, he wants to give readers a deeper um, connection to him through the events so that they kind of understand the events better as if they were there themselves. And um, in the book two, he focuses more on the protesters instead of just himself, which kind of shows how his character has evolved to connecting to the reader and the audience. So um, he focuses more collectively in the end. Um, oh, Mailer's reputation like now? Um, I don't know about now, but I've read a lot of different articles about um, his time before the uh, protests about how he was pretty egotistical and 
um, a womanizer since he's had a lot of different wives. And um, so he did not have a great reputation. So that was probably why he had a um, very critical um, eye on the media. I'm wondering about Mailer's opinion on the 9-11 attack on the Pentagon as a real rather than metaphoric exorcism. Um, where can we see Mailer's influence in journalism today? Um, I do think Mailer, um, he really helped other maybe reporters give more detail and better understanding of events when they write articles like nowadays it's um more than just the facts it's a lot more detailed and um some i would say i've seen some new york times articles that show a little bit of opinion from the author and i think he pretty he had a pretty good influence on that thanks um, one more question perhaps yeah um did mailer interject subjectivity into an objective field or do you think it was more like a new kind of subjectivity? Um, I think Mailer really aimed to provide a new kind of subjectivity because um, he wrote his novel after like Truman Capote and Tom Wolfe, and he wanted to expand on what they did. So he wanted to bring about a new kind of subjectivity um, outside of the objective field. All right, very good. Thank you very much, everybody. Give um, Denise a virtual hand, round of applause. Um, it is now 2.26, um, and so I'm going to postpone our next, uh, the start of our next one until 2.35. Um, everybody just remember that you have to exit this Google Meet and join um, the the, the the one on myth making and unmaking okay so we can all say goodbye for now and uh, i will see everybody at 2 35 hopefully that's enough time for a bathroom break and maybe a drink change thanks everybody good job everybody